Uh, it definitely did in the beginning and it continues to be such a help. It, I, uh, I suffer from complex post-traumatic stress disorder and um, if I was not able to easily fuel my body, I think eating and getting nourished would have been one of the easiest things for me to discard due to my mental yeah. health. Um, I can't imagine if I was eating a highly inflammatory diet, what space my headspace essentially would be in. Hello everyone, I'm DC. Welcome to the channel. Today on Stories of Healing, we are talking to the Baroness of Beef, Alicia. She has quite a background story. You know, in her younger years, she was obese. She was an alcoholic, addict, addicted to sugar, addicted to alcohol. She had numerous health issues, including mental health issues, suffering from PTSD. But since then, has gone full carnival. She's studying nutrition and becoming a health coach. So it's quite an interesting story. I hope you enjoy it and listen to her story in her own words, and I'll see you soon. How about just a quick introduction, Alicia, and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My name is Alicia. I'm 43 years old, and as you can hear by my accent and DCs, from Australia. Uh, I have been a carnivore now approaching two years. In a couple of months, it will be two years for me. And basically the way that I came to carnivore, like pretty much most of the people that come into carnivore do, was I was on a quest to better my health. I don't think anyone really comes to carnivore because they're feeling great, their weight's in a great place, their health is in a great space. So for me, uh, I had been living on a large amount of opioids and CBD oil for a chronic medical condition that I have called adenomyosis. It's incurable apart from having a total hysterectomy. And I was really on the cusp of doing that. But I really didn't want to go that route if I could avoid it. And I knew that there had to be something out there that wasn't drug related. I, I couldn't keep living on opioids. My liver was struggling. I was getting really nauseous. They're no good for me. So. Yeah. I decided to start looking into nutritional protocols because I've always known that there's something really powerful about the food that we put into our bodies. So, of course, you jump online and you start investigating, start looking. And I originally found keto, and keto was recommended for things like adenomyosis, um, PCOS, any kind of gynecological condition, anything associated with mass inflammation. So I thought, okay, that, that's not too crazy. I don't feel uh, too weird eating this way. I'll give it a go. And so keto was okay for a while uh, until I noticed that I was starving all the time. I just could not get full no matter how much I ate. And I was actually prepping dessert before my main meals. I was more obsessed with the dessert rather than getting that main meal into my body. And I was like, that's really weird. Like I've never never noticed myself being hyper-focused on sweets. So what keto did once I started ripping out the sugars, but I was still basically making fake away foods of, of all yeah. the foods that had originally gotten me into trouble in the first place. Uh, I've been on you know, a few health journeys in my life. I was morbidly obese at one stage. Um, I am a recovering alcoholic who hasn't had a drink in eight years. So there's, there's been a number of kind of pivotal moments along the way of me bettering my health. But what starting to rip out all the stuff that was inflammatory in my diet made me realise is I was completely addicted to sugar and I hadn't even realised it before. So yeah, I find most people, sorry, I find most people don't realise that sugar is an addiction. You know, oh, yeah. it's the thing about, um, like the, the standard Western diet, people don't understand that they actually have an addiction. So they, mm. they're, they're not even looking to fight that addiction because they just don't realize they have it. You know, it's not like drugs yeah. or cigarettes. You realize you know you're addicted. You mm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think some people, because 
you know, sugar isn't really portrayed in a lot of ways in this light, you know, like the the baddie, like cigarettes, like alcohol, all those kinds of things. It, it, and because it's everywhere and it's in everything, it seems relatively benign to a lot of people and they don't realise just how addictive it is, how damaging it is for the body uh, yeah. because it's in, in absolutely everything. So, yeah, I, I just... I didn't actually realise that I was starting to display addict behaviour in line with sugars until I was eating a lot of those keto treats, keto desserts. And, you know, I've told this story a million times, but it really sticks with me. I was once on my way home and I was at a bus stop and I always had keto chocolate on me because I always had to have sweets, even though I was like, it's not really a sweet, but it totally was. Full of these fake sugars that still do things to your blood sugar. They're not great for your body to process. And I I ripped the packet open and it was a huge block of chocolate. And I shoved some in my mouth and I shoved more. And I just kept going and going and going till there was basically nothing left of the packet. And I looked down and in that moment I realised that I was displaying addict behaviour. I was basically eating what my body saw as sugar is the way I used to drink alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. the the keto sort of um, space has really been hijacked by the, the processed food companies, you know, corporations, the same as the standard Western diet. And, you know, the, the fitness industry especially, I this is something I um, sort of came to the same conclusion later on. You know, it's quite addictive. You know, the, the so-called health foods, you know, protein powders, you know, pr- uh, protein bars and things like that, They've they've really got you thinking that, you know, it's high protein, low fat, so it's healthy. It's uh, no sugars, but it's got all the artificial sweeteners, so it's mm-hmm. okay. But they're actually quite addictive because they still have that that, that sweet um, content, you know. And, yeah. th- of course, mixed with the seed oils that they have in them as well, the protein powders, uh, they're quite addictive. You know, I found that in myself, you know, it took me some time to, to realise that, which is why another reason why I keep telling people to stay away from them, you know. Yeah, yeah. It um, it, It's still creating that response in the body and lighting up these dopamine pathways. Yeah. So you're still getting yeah. that pleasure reward stimulation and that's just basically going to keep you addicted. I think, you know, there's something to be said for moderation and, and abstinence and you kind of figure out where you are in there yeah. i'm definitely an abstainer like i just I, I can't have those those things in my diet because they're just they're too inflammatory they're too triggering and i know what's going to happen so like and yeah i'm the same um my my wife she's a great moderator she's japanese mm-hmm. i think you know she sort of grew up moderating myself i i i eat it until it's gone so like, yeah. if we if we bring you know like like a, if there's a box of cookies or something like that or even protein powders or protein bars, if there's something like that in the house, I eat it until it's gone, you know. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I'm Just, the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I think getting back to the, the point of keto and that kind of transition to carnivore, there's some things that will happen along the way and, and, and do for a lot of people that really highlight these underlying issues, not just the prevalent health issue that you come to treat. So mine was definitely sugar and, you know, firing up those those addictive pleasure centres for me. Um, so keto, I guess, saw some, um, some benefit in the sense that I did feel inflammation start to come down. Um, the pain from my, my adenomyosis wasn't as, as gnarly as it had been. Um, yeah. But there were all these things happening, like being starving all the time, the sugar addiction, and I just wasn't, I still wasn't feeling 100% and I felt like I needed to go deeper, like there had to be something a little more prescriptive and distilled down. And so I jumped back online, of course, uh, and started researching again and carnivore just kept on coming up all the time. Yeah. And I don't know what you thought when you first saw Carnivore, but I was like, that is the most insane thing I've ever heard of. How on earth can you survive only eating meat and animal products? Like that's that's mental. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I, I, my, my first words were, you know, BS. You know, um, yeah. 
I thought, you know, it's a gimmick because, you know, athletes, you know, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, athletes in competition uh, preparation have always cut carbs, but it's mm. not a sustainable thing. You know, that's, that's yeah. what, this is what I was thinking. It's not a sustainable thing. You can't do this long term, surely. Mm. Um, but, yeah, as you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was exactly the same. I mean, I, I come from a, a, a background of bodybuilding and uh, it was carbs all the way. Like, mm. uh, and I could not train fasted. Like, I was like, no, nah, I have to have a meal in me. I don't care how close it is to training. I don't care if I'm going to throw up, whatever. Uh, yeah. I And I was just so flooded with carbohydrate and oxalate all the time. And I wasn't prepared to deviate from that because I was like, I need carbohydrate for energy. And then yeah. moving over into carnivore and actually seeing how the body adapts and how you can use, you know, ketogenic energy. It's it's such a game changer. And I'm I'm so glad that I decided to kind of challenge my set of beliefs and perceptions and, and come on over to something like carnivore. So when I first dipped my toe into carnivore, I was very hesitant. As I said, I thought it was completely mad. Um, but the stories that that were out there there were too many of them for there not to be something in there and yeah, at that exactly. point i just yeah I, I was just like i have nothing to lose what's the worst thing that can happen if i at least give this a go because i'm yeah. not getting anywhere now so um my big investment into carnivore at first was seven days i was like that's that's all i'm prepared to try <laughs> uh because i i that's think not long. Have, no, it's not. It's not. Um, but the most amazing thing happened in those seven days. I did it and I stuck to it. And by day seven, I noticed I wasn't taking pain medication anymore. I just, I didn't need okay. So you were on pain medication before carnival? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then what was that for? Uh, for the adenomyosis, to be able to just okay. basically function and, and live my life. Yeah. Um, it's For some people, it's... It can be fairly benign. For me, it was debilitating and it was only getting worse. And it, yeah. and it was interfering with my mental health, my everyday life. And I honestly thought that, that there's basically a glitch in the matrix. I was like, how, how can I have not reached the pill packet today? And I was like, oh, ah, yeah. okay. Anyway, let's go back to keto because I want dessert. So <laughs> off I skipped. <laughs> back to have dessert and... You know, enjoyed that for a little while, but then, of course, again, tired, starving, cold. I was cold all the time, sugar addicted, yeah. and the pain, again, started getting worse. So I thought, you know what, something happened in those seven days. I don't know what it was about eating meat, butter, and eggs, but something happened, so I'm going to try it again. And if the same thing happens to me, this is it for me. Yeah. Went back for another seven days and the exact same thing happened. And here we are, yeah. almost two years later. Well, that's yeah. um, something you just mentioned there is when you went back to eating dessert and sugar, you felt yeah. cold. Yeah. Uh, so your metabolism is not working properly. Um, I think there was a lot that wasn't working properly and I, yeah. just, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared to admit and acknowledge fully at the time that uh yeah. the nutrition was really really playing a pivotal part in that yeah so were you always into bodybuilding before um carnival so i uh, yes i was before carnival i um i found bodybuilding in 2015 and that was in okay. response to getting sober mm -hmm. um drinking drinking had been my life i was the person that would be at the bottle shop as soon as it opened buying enough alcohol to blitz myself for the day. If I ran out, I was up there drunk, buying more. Yeah. Um, it, it almost destroyed my life. And if I hadn't stopped, I wouldn't be here or I'd be in prison or something really bad so would have happened. How long did that go on for? As in which part? The alcohol. The drinking? The drinking? Oh, easily 10 plus years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So... Yeah. Uh, so what age were you when you started drinking then? Um, so I, I started dabbling in alcohol probably in my mid to late teens. Um, okay. But 
but it really started taking a hold as I moved into my early 20s and into my 30s. And, you know, alcoholism is progressive. It, it doesn't get better. It only gets worse. Okay. And um, yeah. my life was completely unmanageable. And, um, yeah, my last drink was on Christmas Eve. Uh, this year will be my, in December, with my ninth year sober. And I, wow. I woke up on Christmas Day and I had never been so hungover in my life and I'd just been a total idiot the night before. I basically ruined my own holiday. Um, yeah. And I just, I looked in the mirror and I was like, I can't live like this anymore. Uh, so yeah. that was it, you know, in the in the true uh, vein of abstinence, cut off. That's it. No more. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what was your life like before that, like growing up? Were you always into health and fitness before that, like as a kid or? Um, I think I wanted to be into health and fitness really badly. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up in, in the 80s and, you know, it was all about Jane Fonda and Denise Austin and, and lots of aerobic yeah. exercise. And in the 90s, step aerobics, I used to I absolutely love doing my mum's Jane Fonda tapes. It was something about the way physicality made me feel. However, I think I was quite a shy child. I, I wasn't really into sports at school. I kind of shied away from that that stuff, um, but I've always had an interest in, in you know, I find muscularity on, on men and, and women amazing and um, it can be really transformative, you know, when you when you stop doing all those yeah. hours of cardio and you, you discover weight training. And um, when I really got involved in it uh, in 2015, uh, when I was about six months into sobriety, that, again, was another really pivotal moment you know that that changed my life as well and, and and I'm still lifting I'm still loving it um it it brought me out of a place of of uncertainty because I had no goals I had nothing to do because drinking had been my life that was my yeah. every day so I had nothing to kind of fill the void of nothingness um yeah. and you know I I'd started putting on weight again because I was just eating whatever I felt like I just I was I wasn't motivated I had no drive and um, the thing that, that actually made me pick up the weights in the first place is that I walked into a supplement store that I used to go in and, and buy all my protein bars and bits and bobs. And there was a poster on the wall of um, a body transformation competition. And it had this beautiful, smiley, fit, muscular woman standing on it. And I don't know what it was about it, but I looked at her and I went, I'm going to do that. And so I did. And I signed up for it and I made sure that everybody knew what I was doing because I wanted to be accountable. And it was yeah. 12 of the hardest weeks of my life, but I came out with, you know, lean muscle that I'd never had before, lowered body fat, feeling like I could take on the world and a completely new perspective on life. Mm -hmm. And um, fast forward a couple of years down the track, I actually ended up being an ambassador and mentor for that supplement brand that I'd to take a chance on and enter a competition so yeah it's, it's amazing yeah. what can happen when you when you just go you know what stuff it i'm going to jump in yeah that's great yeah and that's a that's a great point too is that you started lifting weights you know a lot of women uh, are kind of scared of lifting weights i know back in the day i think it's getting more popular now of course but back in the day when i was first started uh, coaching for example uh, women were too scared because they didn't want to get too muscular sort of thing. Uh, yeah. it's, it's kind of a hard, it's one of those things where it's kind of hard to convince women that it's not going to happen unless you, you know, follow, you know, take things that you shouldn't be taking anyway. Um, yeah. But, you, yeah, so, um, yeah, but it's good. You know, it's good to see that changing, you know. Um, yeah. I think it's strength is never a weakness, you know. So no, I, I like that. No. Yeah. So, uh, growing up, you're always into, um, or you always wanted to be health and fit, uh, healthy and fit. But yeah. um, in on on your channel, you also spoke about you were quite obese in your twenties. Um, yeah. So you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I was really ill due to the weight on my body, um, and I just it was this like the alcoholism. 
I, you know, I don't think the alcohol helped because, you know, I, I discovered drinking yeah. and I was already starting to drink quite heavily at that stage and, and just eating so badly um, mm-hmm. and not exercising and just not taking care of my mental health. And it got to the point where I had to quit my job because even to wake up in the morning and take a sip of a glass of water would give me the worst reflux I've ever experienced in my life. I ended up on medication they give to peptic ulcer patients just to simply be able to handle that in my body. Uh, I just had so much pressure around my belly. Um, And I was completely miserable. And um, I just, I didn't actually see just how unhealthy and how big I was. I think I was in a lot of denial about it at that stage because to look in the mirror was a bit too much. Yeah. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the thing that that was the catalyst of change, even though you know I was on the, this medication and also trying like every kind of crash diet, shake, ridiculous pill and potion out there that you could, I ended up on um, Xenical at one stage, which is a hideous drug. Um, yeah. which basically stops your body from absorbing your dietary fat. And you can imagine what happens to you if you eat too much fat on those tablets. And um, uh, th- they've also seen cancerous changes in rats in labs due to that drug, yeah. um, which, of course, yeah. wasn't released at the time. Um, so, you know, all, the, all those things that were happening still weren't enough motivation. And unfortunately, what my motivation was for change was um, having a carload of boys scream out a window at me on the street, you fat so-and-so. And, so. and I, don't, I don't know what it was about. Yeah, I know. It was pretty brutal. Um, I don't know what it was about that. Maybe, maybe that kind of shook me a little, but I was devastated. <laughs> and... Yeah. Um, and I was like, there's, there's something not right. I was going into clothing shops and literally nothing would fit me. And I would come out in tears, furious, going, it's the clothing store's fault and they don't have a size for me and all those kinds of things. And I just wasn't, I wasn't ready to accept how unhealthy and how miser- miserable I was. So even but- though that was a horrible event, I'm, st- I'm still, I'm still really grateful for it because it, it inspired change and for me to actually look within and be like, are you happy? Are you healthy? I don't think so, girl. That's a, that's a very good, actually, that's something that uh, happens a lot here in Australia is um, because the obesity has become normalised, if a cl- particular clothing brand in Australia doesn't have large sizes for women or people in general, they complain, you know, and, and it's quite, you might see it, it's quite a common thing. They actually complain that this and, and put a lot of pressure on this company to produce larger size clothes rather than just going and buying from somewhere else or a different brand. Let your money do the talking sort of thing. Um, yeah. But like you said, for you, it was a wake-up call. And I think yeah. that that sh- is what it should be. Um you know, I spent a, a number of years, I spent 10 years living in Japan. Mm. And that's what it is. You know, uh, the, uh, I mean, the obesity has been climbing in Japan because of the seed oils and things like that that have been, re- that have been introduced. However, they don't, they don't, um, they don't sort of um, bow down to people complaining about certain brands not having uh, big enough, large enough sizes for fat people. They just, you know, a lot of them just take it as a hint like you did and try to do something about their diet, uh, which I think it, may, it makes you more responsible. You know, I think that's where it, it all sort of lies as well. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not I saying think. it's all, I'm not saying it's all our fault because we are lied to a lot. We are lied to in our education. We're lied to, um, and, you know, the whole calorie counting sort of in and out garbage um and the the absolute toxic food that uh, is sold to us in supermarkets and things like that however oh, yeah it uh, there's also a certain amount of responsibility we need to, t- to take ourselves as well you know like you did and i think that's that's the good responsible um reaction that people should take i think 
So yeah, I think well, like well I, I said, yeah. <laughs> thank you. As I said, you know, it, it wasn't the most beautiful thing that could have been screamed out a car window to me, but, you know, you, you hit something really on the head there and it's that taking control and personal responsibility for, for your health, you know, that's that's your job in life yeah. to take yeah, care right. of this amazing machine that that you've been lucky to be born into you know um yeah it's it's a, re it's a real privilege to to have a happy healthy body and I, and I think the more you invest in that the more that pays off and that's you know I'm studying to be nutritionist I'm months away from being certified and I'm so excited to be able to Excellent. you know not only help people with their health and fitness goals but but also that mindset and that mind shift you know and yeah. and being accountable for your own health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So you just mentioned that you're, you're almost a certified nutritionist. So what are you doing at the moment? You're studying? Yeah, yeah. So um, okay. I started studying with an institution that I thought would be really good for me. And um, let's just say there's it was very agenda-driven um, yeah. and not a good environment for me. And I realised that the the qualification I would have come out with really wouldn't have been worth the paper it was written on. Uh, so I, I quickly pivoted because this is so incredibly important to me to to get this qualification and to be able to be a nutritionist and a health coach. You know, that's I could not think of anything that feels more right, more nourishing to me to do with my life. I'm currently working in retail and I have been for a long time. That's great. It pays the bills. But I don't wake up in the morning with this excitement in my belly that I'm doing something good for the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, selling clothes is great, wonderful. We all need clothes, but I, I just I felt like there was something that that made more sense to me. Uh, so I'm now studying with an institution which I absolutely love. You know, of course you're going to have to eat some some humble pie and box tick and talk about things like the government uh, guidelines. But what I love about them is that they are so inclusive and embracive of things like keto, carnivore, uh, low carb, paleo, animal based. Like you, I don't have to dull myself down, which I love yeah. in that sense, you know, oh, and I just actually, yeah, I've just done an assessment where I got to talk at length about, about carnivore and, 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 they're like, okay, yeah, cool. You know, we ask the question, you've given the answer. Um, so there's that that's been an amazing, amazing part of, of feeling motivated in that sense that I'm not just like, oh, I have to say everything you want me to say. I mean, if they ask you to talk about something, of course you need to talk about something. And um, you know, looking at things like the government guidelines, I think, I think for a lot of people in, in the sense of, of healthy eating, it's it can be a good jumping off point because a lot yeah. of people will come to that to, to those guidelines and they'll be eating far better than they were before and putting less rubbish into their body so i'm happy for anything that's kind of a vehicle towards optimal health um and you know when i work as a nutritionist of course m my kind of point of interest will definitely be keto and, and, and carnivore health um but yeah. anyone is welcome to have a consultation with me once I'm certified. I don't care what you eat, who you are. If you want to be happy and healthy, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, I, I can imagine, like, um, like I've spoken to a, a number of students, you know, and uh, you, you really have to bite your tongue um, in the mm -hmm. t in today's education system. Yeah. Um, as, you know, a lot of, unfortunately, our education system is, is filled with uh, more activist rather than scientist or teachers really um yeah so that can be a, a little bit of a, a a little bit tough to navigate so and yeah. finding the right institution like you said can be uh, quite difficult to navigate as well so who do you study with uh, uh the australian institute of personal training oh okay okay Very yeah. good. yeah what is uh your favorite thing about the carnival diet then well apart from the fact that i get to eat amazing fatty meat every single day of my life uh, i mm -hmm. think it's the simplicity that i really enjoy my life was like yeah. super complicated when it came to meal prep before and if there wasn't like 10 billion colors and things going on on the plate then i was like oh this isn't enough or this isn't yeah. nutritious enough 
um, you know, you kind of get a bit obsessed with, you know, having this like perfectly healthy plate. And I'd spend hours meal prepping these elaborate things yeah. that half the time I would end up throwing away because I wouldn't eat them because I'd go and buy something else. And, um, yeah, it's just knowing that I can get up, go to my fridge, I have simple ingredients. People, and they probably ask you the same thing, they're like, don't you get bored though? Like, is this not yeah. boring? Don't you want variety? <laughs> I'm like, you don't understand. Once you're Once you're really deep into this way of eating, that is, it's just not even a thought. Okay, sure, you might be like, I'll have a scotch fillet today rather than a rump steak. That's like life's biggest decision when it, or something like that when yeah. it comes to eating. Um, so I think that food freedom, that that transfers into other areas of your life. You know, I have so much more time now to invest in university, to invest in my channel, to just invest back into to myself and my life. And, yeah, who doesn't want that freedom? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the time, the time saving is in, incredible. Mm. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, shopping, just thinking about meal preparation, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Um, <laughs> that, like you said, the preparation is just, you know, it just cuts out hours a day. And, you know, um, it, like a, even a healthy bodybuilding sort of diet, you, you're sort of thinking, yeah, my food has, to, my plate has to have lots of colour in it to get all the yeah. nutrients that I need sort of thing, you know. So yeah. once you get your head around the fact that you don't need all that, which uh, sometimes takes a little while, it uh, it's sure. really is food freedom, isn't it? Um, yeah. And you, you speak like I remember, you know, there were so, you know, periods in my days I'd have six or seven meals in a day and you, you're breaking oh, yeah. it up, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically you're spending your whole day just preparing food, you know. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, you know. Yeah, so, preparing food, then eating the food, then preparing more food, then thinking about eating yeah. and preparing more food. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember those yeah. days. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't <laughs> believe I got. I can't I really can't believe I got anything else done. You know, it, everything's centered <laughs> around food. When did I have time to go to work or go to the gym or do anything else? You know, it was, right? it was crazy. So yeah, yeah, but. Like I keep saying to people, it's when you come to the realization that you don't need all that. Um, it's amazing how basic, how easy it is to eat because, and, and it should be, it should be that easy, really. It's our next basic in instinct to breathing, you know, mm. and you don't need to prepare anything for that. You just keep doing it, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's where it should be. Yeah, I think as yeah. well. For me on carnivore, and I don't know how you feel, but food for me was, you know, definitely pleasure reward kind of thing. It was like, yes, yeah. I was eating for fuel and nutrition, but it like all the events in life were were centered around food. Like it's my it's my birthday. I get to eat as much cake or as much whatever yeah. I, as I like. Oh, this yeah. great thing happened. I need to eat this. And now it's just it's life that's the celebration. Food is just there. Do I love my food? Heck yeah. Yeah, I, I love every single meal I put into my body. But once the meal's done, it's done. There's nothing attached to it, and that's what I really love. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Food is um, become, in our culture, it's also become entertainment. Yeah. You know? and, and we also see it as reward. So yeah. if we say like we have a good day or we have a good week, like we've been, we haven't been naughty and eating the chocolate, so to speak, we reward ourselves with an ice cream or, or a pizza or something and just completely yeah. ruin the week, you know? Yeah. So um, it's, it's just the way it's been developed in our culture, I guess. And, mm. yeah, it's a very much a social thing as well. Um, yeah. You know, we go out, everything is around, you know, People can't hold a decent conversation these days without stuffing their face full of cake or 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 beer or nuts and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So, have you found it difficult socially? No, I really um, haven't. I think, I think at first, of course, people were like, "What are you doing?" Uh, but hmm. you know what? Half the time, people don't even notice what's going on on my plate. They're far too busy filling theirs. Um, yeah. Have I used some decoy vegetable on occasion, particularly in the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> you stick a bit <laughs> of salad on your plate. You don't touch it, but nobody notices and nobody cares. And I think if you're just gently having a pot plant. 
<laughs> <laughs> Put it under the serviette. Um, I think, and I think as, as well, if you have the conversations, if people are genuinely curious about it, you know, mm. you don't, you don't have to go into at length and talk about ancestral eating and do and freak people out. <laughs> I think, you know, if you're saying, look, I'm, I'm actually doing this for health reasons, it's really working for me. If you're interested in having a conversation about it, sure, we can talk or I can point you in the direction of some really good sources so you can kind of do your own investigation. I don't, I feel like some people feel that they just, they have to explain, justify and defend their way of eating. And yeah. it, the only person it should matter to is you. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I tell people that all the time. You don't have to justify what you eat uh, to anyone. Um, and you do tend to get that. A lot of people, especially in forums, you know, people will ask, like even in the carnival <laughs> forums, people ask, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of uh, coffee? What do you think of honey and all this sort of stuff? Like, yeah. If you feel good, if you feel good, like why are you asking other people, you know, if, you know, to justify what you are eating, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And how clean and serious you want to go on your diet is completely up to what your needs are. And what your Absolutely. goals are, you know. Yeah, I completely um, agree. However, one one thing I do stress to people, though, if I mean, many people do keep coffee, for example, um, and if you have like homemade, you know, beans, you know, coffee beans, you know, drip coffee or something like that, that's fine. But yeah, I I have found that many uh, people on Carnival do go to coffee shops like and buy themselves like a large latte, for example. From Starbucks yeah. group, yeah, um, and that that is a problem because it is not only like it's like a venti latte has you know more sugar than uh, seven glazed donuts. You might as well eat the box of donuts. Um, yeah, and they have like five different seed oils, and ev pretty much everything that Starbucks serves is full of seed oils. So uh, yeah. th that that can be a problem. They they think that keeping a coffee, I feel okay. I'm mean, keeping the coffee, but there's a difference between like, you know, ground beans and, and going to Starbucks, you know. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you, oh, look, I've said it before, there's 50 shades of carnivory and whatever works yeah. for you, great. If you want to keep mm -hmm. pepper in, if you want to keep coffee in, whatever, live a happy, healthy life. If it's not causing you issues, that's fine. I think People can be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still on an animal-based way of eating, but I'm, I'm adding these external things in. But what they, they don't look at is really drilling down into the, the nutrition labels and seeing what's actually in there. Um, yeah. Because all these things, like they, they will just sneak so many things into food that you just don't even think yeah. of. And um, I, I stopped eating bacon a little while ago, not because I, I had any problems with bacon. I freaking love pork. But I switched and started eating um, pork belly slices because oh, yeah. I'd never, feel, yeah, I'd never feel that good after eating bacon. And I thought the stuff I was getting was fairly clean. And then I really investigated it, and I was like, this, you know, malted dextran, dextrose, the different nitrates, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, ah, it's why I'm not feeling a hundred percent. Switch to the pork belly, no issues. So yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting what you'll notice that you didn't find a problem before once you actually cut it out and maybe mm. substitute it with something that's a little bit cleaner. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, be wary. I think that is um, also because when you, uh, the, especially the, the longer you go on carnival, the cleaner your body is and the more sensitive mm. it is to, to find. So you can actually, um, when you find that you react to different foods, you're, you're far more sensitive to pick these things up. So I think as you go, you can, you know, you, you eventually eliminate these sorts of things. It's really good about that. Um, beforehand, you just, you know, everything, all your senses are just completely blocked. You know, even the standard Western diet, for example, you just, you don't feel anything. You're completely numb. You know? Yeah. You know, so. We well, have a palate that's completely saturated and a system that's completely saturated with things that, aren't meant to be in the body <laughs> uh, yeah, so right. it's amazing when yeah you distill the diet down and and in the beginning i was like how can i live without spice and taste and the <laughs> only thing i use now is salt and i love yeah. actually tasting the meat that i'm eating it's it's so yeah. different yeah so what does uh, your 
uh, day of diet or what does your um, day of carnivore look like in eating? It's probably very boring. <laughs> it's usually the <laughs> same thing. Um, yeah, yeah. It's probably boring to, to an outsider, but to me it's fabulous. So uh, predominantly, you know, as, as my name, the Baroness of Beef might suggest, most of my diet is beef. Uh, I feel the best um, that I ever do when there's, there's like 90% beef in my diet. As I said, I will have some pork belly slices as bacon. I had that this morning with four scrambled eggs and lots of butter. It was so good. Um, mm. I love scotch fillets um, or ribeyes for the Americans. Um, uh, chicken I used to love, but after cutting it out and reintroducing it, chicken's a problem for me, <laughs> um, yeah, which, I, I which I'm chicken. sad about. <laughs> Because I love carnivore crumb chicken done in pork panko, but um, I don't know how that's going to go now, but that's okay. Um, but, yeah, I, I eat so much uh, ground beef. It's not funny. Like if if you said you can only have burger patties for the rest of your life, I'd be like, fine. Yeah, yeah. and I'm typically, yes. I'm typically a two-mad girl as well. Two meals for me is the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, two meals is pretty good. I, I, I sort of fluctuate between two and three meals. Um, mm. like if, if I have three meals, it's just my second meal broken up over two. <laughs> That's really basically it. Yeah. Very yeah. simple. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, do you, I mean, for me, I like a variety of meats. I like, uh, I very much like lamb because it's very fatty, mm -hmm. um, yeah. high omega threes and things like that. Um, your seafood's great too, but, uh, unfortunately you can't get great seafood here in Australia. Yeah, it's tricky. I yeah, love my is, salmon and I love my prawns too. So yeah, mm, yeah. So okay. So transitioning to carnival from keto, did you have any difficulties? Oh yeah, <laughs> that I, I wasn't quite ready for, and um, I really loved that. I in one of my tracking apps on my phone, I diarized what was happening to my body when I first transitioned from keto to carnivore. I was just I was purely curious to see if anything would happen like I'd gone through the keto flu moving from a standard Australian diet to keto so I was like oh it can't possibly be that bad um and I think it was about seven or eight days into into really getting into carnival like committing to it and um I started having symptoms that I was like I, don't, I really don't feel very well I was really tired I was getting headachey um really sick to my stomach I would wake up dry retching um and what I didn't realize was happening for me at the time is I was herxing out it was candy to die yeah. off um and I, I had no idea what that that even was and and I, I pro probably had a little bit of oxalate dumping happening at the same time it's a very different feeling in the body even though there is some crossover between symptomology it's yeah, there's a definite feeling to if you're herxing out um, yeah. from those cells dying and releasing toxins to if you're starting to release that sequestered oxalate. Um, lucky for me, it was short lived, but it was brutal. Like I felt like crap. And I think that's the point that that most people, you know, slam on the brakes with carnivore um, and go, there's something really wrong because they don't realize what can happen to your body once yeah. you know it, it starts removing and detoxing and your gut microbiome starts changing. So I'm actually mm -hmm. really glad I had that experience to be able to talk about with future clients um, because I've, I've been through it. I know what it's like and um, and what can happen to your body. And, and now you know all those kinds of things like herxing out. I take as a good thing because <laughs> well, it actually means that your body's doing what. It, it, it's meant to be doing it and getting rid of something in there that, yeah, that's right. you know, an overgrowth is, is horrible. Most people don't even realise that they have candida overgrowth until they do yeah. something dietarily and um, and those cells start dying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't understand how your body um, really works when it comes to uh, the systems, of the body, like the lymphatic system, when you mm. start – um, taking in uh, enough dietary fat to actually clean your body and get your hormone production, everything going. The reason why they call it keto flu is because you get flu-like symptoms and you get mucus, like esophageal um, mucus and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, it's a natural reaction to, you know, the esophageal mucus is actually um, part of your immune system pushing out toxins. 
You know, yeah, that's uh, just a natural reaction. Um, and of course, you know, people don't understand just how uh, how much change is involved in your body when it, when uh, related related to diet. You know, because we don't, we always think beforehand, like you know, the education is all about. So it doesn't matter as long as you get your your calories low and your output high. It's all about calories. Uh, so it's it doesn't matter sort of thing what you eat, but they don't understand. There's, you, we don't thrive on calories; we thrive on nutrients. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it was all about calories, we, you know, I could eat ice cream all day, and you know, everything would be great as long as I didn't <laughs> eat more than two and a half thousand calories. You know, yeah, cap yeah. it and you're fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. cap it and you're good. So, um, yeah, it's just another myth, another lie that we you know we have to dispel. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there you go. That's a uh, that's a whole other program. That <laughs> I was one. gonna say, oh, that's, that's yeah, that's a whole other video. <laughs> oh yeah, that's uh, we could talk forever on that alone. Yeah. Actually, so um, will you ever go back to uh, a carnivore, or will you ever include other foods? No, at this stage, no. everyone asks me this in an interview, and. I think I've said I don't have a crystal ball and I can't predict the future, but why would I want to disrupt how good I feel? There's yeah. there's no benefit or payoff or reason for me to go back. Why would I want to go back to being starving, having my hormones trashed <laughs> yeah. uh, when, you know, I wake up every day knowing I'm going to nourish my body, my nutritional protocol works for me and I, I have no reason to deviate yeah. like there is there's, there's nothing there's no french fry no bucket of ice cream no chocolate bar that's worth destroying my health 100 no, percent. Right. yeah yeah not, nothing tastes as good as how you feel right now oh nailed it yeah 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 so that's that's something people don't understand is that, um i this is uh, another thing i keep telling people too is that these uh, foods that they used to call treats, they're not treats, they are setback foods. You know? <laughs> they are foods that hold you back from becoming or for hold you back from your goals, from achieving your goals. So therefore they are setback foods. You know? Yeah. So that, I think that's you leave great. There, you, why go back to it? You know? I think yeah, there's there's set, much better ways you can treat yourself, hey? Like take yourself oh, for a nice massage, go for a hike. Watch that yeah. movie you really wanted to watch. Re go yeah. and buy yourself that book you've been after. Like there are so many more things that you can actually do. Yeah, than, that's than right. Put that sugar into the body. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, literally. You know, food is um, the nutrients you need to make your you make your life interesting, not not your food interesting. You know. So. Boom. Yeah. yeah. What do your family and friends think about your carnivore diet and your lifestyle now? Compared they're, to before. <laughs> they're actually really good about it. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. At first, you know, my family were a bit like, beg your pardon. Uh, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this. Um, but I think they actually find it quite intriguing. Um, and I, I think they're quietly interested and they've seen what's happened for me and my health and they can't deny the results. Um, you know, my skin's looking great. My weight's in a great place. My adeno is whisper quiet, um, and I'm reaping so many benefits from it. Um, so they have no reason to to think that it's weird or extreme. That they, they they just kind of embrace it now. And you know, when I go and see the family, they're actually like, "Oh, we bought you this steak, and here's this cheese," and and like so they're kind mm -hmm. of invested, which I which I think is super cute. And um, it was really interesting. I, don't, I mean, unfortunately, my my beautiful aunt passed away a little while ago and after her, her service, we were all at her house having a meal as a family to have that connection and everyone had brought home uh, food from the wake and you can imagine what type of food it was, you know, a lot of finger yeah. foods, a lot of sugary stuff, all that kind of thing and I fried up the biggest, fattiest ribeye in a pan with two eggs and just sat down at the head of the table and I could feel everyone staring at my plate and it wasn't a, ah, oh, what's that? It's a, oh, my gosh, I want that. <laughs> and I'll never forget that moment. Um, and I was like, you can't have any because it's all for me. 
you can eat whatever's going on <laughs> on your side. Enjoy the enjoy the finger sandwiches. Um, so yeah, and, and my my friends just yeah they know if we go out, I'm just going to be like saying to the waiter, I just want meat on a plate, no vegetables, no nothing, and and they're just they're used to that now. So I, I again, I don't feel the need to explain, defend. Um, it, I, I feel really embraced. So, and I, I wish it, that was the case for everybody. I know that there's a lot of people that that can't bring their carnivory or their animal animal based way of eating to the forefront because they they fear the judgment because yeah. you know it's it's completely skewed from everything that that we've ever been taught about nutrition and health. Um, yeah. And and I feel like they they feel like they really have to go into bat for themselves, and they, those conversations can be exhausting. Um, so a lot of people keep it to themselves and keep it hidden. But, um, you know, we were talking just before we, we started recording that there are more voices becoming louder and people actually yeah. connecting. And I think that's such an important part of the carnivore community is being able to have those connections because it's very rare that you meet someone just down the street that happens to be a carnivore. You know, we're kind of spread all over the world. So to be able to share our stories and connect that way, you know, via platforms like YouTube or any of the socials, that's what an age and what a day we live in that we can do that. Imagine going it completely yeah. alone. Yeah. I mean, some people are fine going and being lone wolves and I respect that, but more often than not, people people need that that connection for mental health. We need to bounce ideas off one another. We need to hear each other's stories and be inspired. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it just needs to be out there too because um, I there are so many things going on around the world right now and people are waking up to um, to all of it. It's not just a political movement. It's not just um, a health thing. It's everything. And, um, yeah, this is just part of it. And uh, so I think it's a great thing that people, uh, they need to see every, every side of uh, the argument as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what about advice? What advice would you give anyone who is starting the carnivore diet? Go slow and if you need to step down the ladder, don't just jump straight from a standard diet into carnivore. Some people can do it, no problem. But for a lot of people, it it really causes some issues. So yeah. be gentle with yourself. Give yourself ample time to transition. Like I said, if you if you feel like you need that connection, there are so many different forums, coaches, channels available. So make sure that that you really take the time to go and look at those. If you feel like you need to reach out for support, absolutely do it. It's, it's one of the things I've made so many friends and connections through the carnivore community and and most people are really, you know, open and receptive. And um, like I said before, don't don't feel the urge to defend and explain yourself. You're, you're doing what you want to do for your health. It's your journey. Well, that's it. Um, ultimately, you pay the price for what you put into your body. So try not to be um, too concerned about what other people may think of it uh, because yeah. you're the one that has to deal with the consequences. So yeah, uh, this is your channel here. Uh, is there anywhere else uh, people can reach or can follow along with uh, your story? No, I'm very boring and mostly off socials. Um, I don't do Insta yet. I think when I start coaching, that's something that I will do. Uh, if, okay. if you would like to reach out to me, my email address is in the bio on my YouTube channel. But please feel free to come on over and uh, subscribe. Got some great content in the works coming up. And, um, yeah, the, the channel is about sharing connection and having a couple of laughs along the way because, really, life's too short to be too serious. Yeah, I agree. That's good. Um, lastly, what about uh, you, you spoke a little bit about mental health there before too. Has has that really changed dramatically for you since going carnival? Uh, it definitely did in the beginning and it continues to be such a help. It, I, uh, I suffer from complex post-traumatic stress disorder and um, if I was not able to easily fuel my body, 
I think eating and getting nourished would have been one of the easiest things for me to discard due to my mental yeah. health. Um, I can't imagine if I was eating a highly inflammatory diet, what space my headspace essentially would be in. Uh, but definitely going carnivore, you notice that you are so much less reactive. There's this systemic calm. They, I think they call it the zero carb zen, right? Yeah. Um, and you'll definitely feel that. And I think that speaks, like I said, to the inflammation coming down to actually giving the body proper nourishment. You know, a lot of people that come to carnivore are completely fat deprived. You know, the, the dietary yeah, fat intake is completely inadequate. And I know mine was. And I noticed the more fat I ate, the better I feel, the uh, better I felt. You know, that, that cortisol was in a much better space. So I see it all the time, though, people talking about how carnivore has impacted their mental health positively. So, yeah, it, it has so many benefits, and that's just one of them.